Thank, Thank you, you Teresa. We are now live, so we're officially starting the continuation of our afternoon committee meeting um, of creations. And uh, we are going to continue with testimony uh, at this point. And um, we have the Attorney General with us. Welcome. Uh, Willa Farrell, welcome, because you are um, going to talk with us about uh, the diversion program. And we have your financial uh, person, Marcy, you moved. You were over here on my Hollywood squares, and now you've moved to the other side. So Chip, this is your budget, and you have uh, the concerns. So I'm going to turn this right over uh, to you. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, so I just, uh, so I've had a couple of emails, um, uh, mostly with uh, Marcy about this, um, but having um, dealt with it in that with the diversion program in the past um, and talking to Willa I it just seems to me that diversion is um, such an important part of our um, criminal justice uh, system and our approach to that um, uh, and particularly now maybe um, given the situation with COVID and the and the backlog um, of, of cases in the court system um, you know, it, and and having heard from them that there is a, a fairly significant revenue shortage um, for reasons I'll let them explain to you, um, I thought it was important to bring them in to um, talk to the committee so that we could get an understanding of what it means, what the present situation and their, their lack of revenue means. If, if that continues, what it will mean in terms of um, what kinds of uh, reduction in services will have to happen in order to make their budgets work um, and and then for the committee to have a discussion afterwards about whether um, well th that this should be on our radar and and as we go forward with the budget try to figure out whether there are ways we can um, uh, change the situation in terms of their revenue um, or their their uh, funding so um, with that um, stuttering introduction, I will just turn it over to uh, Willa, who will probably take the lead on this, I would assume, unless it's TJ, I see he's unmuted. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Representative Conquest. Um, well said. I mean, diversion is uh, a program that is um, really been in the vanguard of reforming our criminal justice system and addressing not only kind of first time offenders, but then transitioning to um, dealing with those more serious issues, whether it's mental health, uh, whether it's addiction, whether it's poverty, that frankly the criminal justice system is ill-equipped to deal with. Diversion has been a uh, really an award-winning program to uh, treat Vermonters fairly uh, by investing in the community. Uh, Willa Farrell, who's on, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, has been a leader uh, of not only diversion, but of reforming our criminal justice system really for the last um, couple of decades. And um, this is, as we all know, and Representative Conquest, you said it best, uh, we have a revenue shortage because diversion uh, has um, a fee. And when COVID hit in March, obviously the courts shut down. And that meant that people were not going into court, who then were not being referred uh, to, the, to diversion. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have a revenue shortage based on that, that uh, the number we're asking for is, of course, annualized out. Um, and I agree with Representative Conquest. I would fully expect as we go back online and have people in courts and open up that um, diversion will be needed uh, more so uh, now more than ever. Uh, but with that, let me turn it over to uh, my colleague and friend, Willa Farrell. Thank you, TJ. Um, I'll just make the same points and elaborate a little bit. Um, as you can imagine, when um, the pandemic arrived in Vermont and things in the courts shut down. Um, programs really closed as well. Um, and this led to a couple of uh, effects in terms of the revenue. Um, as TJ, as the Attorney General mentioned, um, people were not being referred to the program. And in addition, people who were already involved in court diversion um, who had a fee to pay typically many of them were in dire financial straits themselves and stopped paying or had other pressing priorities to deal with health and other family issues um, where they 
just lost contact with the program. Um, I should step back for a minute and note that um, fees are really a key part of the revenue stream to, to run court diversion and pretrial services. Um, we don't charge a fee in the pretrial services program, but there is a $175 fee that's a standard um, fee across the state for misdemeanor referrals and underage possession of alcohol or marijuana referrals. We follow a standard fee schedule and many people um, have their fee reduced. Payment plans are just commonality. Um, and some people, the fee is waived completely. But even with those reductions, um, statewide, about a quarter of the money that supports these programs comes from client fees. So it's a really major um, stream that supports the operation of the services. Um, we've projected, based on the loss of revenue during the last quarter of FY20, uh, and compared to the fee revenue that we brought in in FY19, which had already started to drop off, compared to previous years, despite a really significant increase in referrals for the reasons that the AG has mentioned, um, we are projecting for FY21, um, a shortfall of 162,000 across the state. Um, that's our best educated uh, estimate um, based on, on past history, but as you know, as I keep saying in, in all my conversations around anything these days is there's just a lot of uncertainty um, with the pandemic and how that plays out in, in every system. So courts are coming back <clears throat> and we are starting to see an uptick in referrals. It varies by county, as you can imagine. Each courthouse is different, We've got different judges and prosecutors. Um, so the uh, programs are operating, staff are operating, are working with people. There's a lot happening similar to this, um, remote meetings, um, but some in-person meetings. Um, one of the ways that programs are adapting and courts are adapting is that people are typically being referred um, without having to go into the courthouse. Um, so staff are reaching out to people based on referral from a prosecutor um, and it, frankly, it's more difficult to connect with people if you haven't met them in person in, in the courthouse. Um, but part of, you know, at this point, we often talk about diversion, diverting people out of the court system. And these days, we're even just diverting them out of the building. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of adjusting and um, creative thinking about how to connect with people. Um, and in talking with program directors around their budgets. Um, we were able to level fund their grants this year based on carry forward funds, but they all are looking at their reduction in fees. And we've started to have the conversation, well, what, what does that mean? If, if your fee revenue doesn't come in in the coming year in the way that it has in past years, how will you respond? And while I haven't spoken with all directors, the the message I'm hearing is um, cutting staff hours. Um, these are pr <clears throat> primarily nonprofit agencies who have a little more flexibility than say state government. So it's, they can be creative in reducing hours and not necessarily, you know, cutting to half time and such. Um, and, the, and then the play out from that, which really is the uh, area of huge concern is what that means for the services. As you know, in our previous testimony, we've spoken about the heavy um, caseloads that people carry. And I'm concerned as our directors that as they cut staff and referrals um, increase or you know, ratchet up back to um, pre the, the pattern we were seeing in the before the spring, um, that these caseloads will really just be unsustainable. And I think um, we're, and we've, We've sort of just put our toe into this conversation because people are really reluctant to talk about, um, you know, triaging or not doing the full array of work that is asked of them. Um, as you can imagine, and I know you, many of you know your local um, program director. They're really passionate about criminal justice reform and restorative justice and meeting people's needs. 
um, and work hard and diligently to be creative. And yet there's the point where, you know, financial constraints and I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking to a group that knows this more than, you know, most people in the state, I realize um, there does come a point where services are affected. And so um, that's why we're here today. Um, thanks to Representative Conquest that, you know, we ask that you consider an increase of about 162,000, which is our, you know, our best educated estimate of the lost fee revenue and, and this, um, coming fiscal year, or I guess it's this fiscal year. So thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. And I don't know if Marcy wants to add anything or we of course are happy to take questions. Uh, we have a, thank you, Willa. Um, we have a question from Diane and then I, I need to make my math work here. I've been doing some shorthand math and my numbers aren't working and I'm hoping you can help me. Okay. Diane? Hmm. Thank you. Um, I, my question was really is is around. You've got th there's three downs in that area, but the one the 162 is the one that's your, the most concerning to make sure that we can, if we could restore, is the first one. And could is that ongoing or one one time dollars work there? I have to say I don't know uh, uh, the documents you're looking oh. at, so I'll only speak to the 162. That's our um, estimate for this fiscal year, and when I say uncertainty, I I frankly don't know what FY22 will bring. Um, yeah. It could it could be the effects of the pandemic, yeah. you know, go beyond. I I don't yeah. know. Well, the other downs I think Diane was referring to is within the. Fund. Were you given targets, Marcy, to meet? Were you given a 3% target or something like that? Can you speak to those as well? Are you, you are muted. Thank you. Um, we were given a 3% reduction target, which is the 81,465. We have carry forward from FY20 so that we can fill that hole for FY21 but that reduction to our base, we would need it back again in 22, um, where that would be an actual cut to the program dollars. So there's uh, an 81,000 that you are showing the reduction, but you're using your carry forward as one time as a bridge into 22. Correct. The problem there. And then, um, and then within uh, personal services, um, was there a, a reduction, there was a reduction. Is it was that um I see the general fund, the special fund, and Diane, what was the third one you saw? I'm not that was a, the one hundred thousand above it, the no programmatic impact, only bringing fee revenue spending authority in line with actual experience, and that was a reduction of a hundred thousand. Yep, so that has no program impact, and that's just back end of the house fixing so okay. that it reflects actual. So if we were to slice and dice this, it's the 162 that's really, really the most critical here. For 21, and then for 22, we would need the 81. Okay. And Potentially, uh, we would need the 81. Marcy, so the additional $100,000 reduction that you walk through that has no programmatic reduction, when I look at my two grants lines from the governor in January to the governor's recommend in August, um, the grants, I see a difference of 262, not 162. So is the 262 that other 100 that has no program? Yep. Yep. Why is that in the grant line then if, it, if it's not granted out for programs? Because in Vantage, we have to match the revenue with the expense. And so the only expense in court diversion is the grants up to the programs. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. That's where my math, so my math did work. I just couldn't explain it. Thank you. Um, are there other questions uh, for either the Attorney General or for Willa or Marcy? Chip, did you want to? Um, did you have more to say at this point? Um, I, not, not, uh, not really. I just, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to um, ask questions if the committee has it, um, and and for the folks at the. Uh, Attorney General's office and diversion in particular to 
to just make clear to us what the implications are of this loss of revenue. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe I would ask TJ um, to reiterate whether, you know, as, as the courts open back up um, and address their backlog, uh, doesn't it, does it seem likely that, um, that there may be even a greater demand on the diversion program because, yeah. um, you know, uh, prosecutors and the courts will want to get those, those cases moved along? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, uh, <clears throat> Representative Conquest. I think as the courts open up and the cases come in, if you're that prosecutor, what's going to happen is you're going to triage and you're going to go to the most serious cases first, as frankly you should. Um, and diversion is going to be a avenue uh, that many cases are going to flow down <clears throat> for not only because it's the right thing and the, the appropriate uh, forum, uh, uh, but because almost out of necessity, these cases are going to have to go somewhere with a backlog. You're now going to be overwhelmed, and there's going to be and there's going to be a push to get cases out of the system uh, in order to alleviate the backlog. And diversion is obviously, um, I think, in a good way, going to be the beneficiary uh, of those uh, of that volume of cases going somewhere, and it's going to be to diversion. Um, and we accept that. Uh, we welcome it. I actually, again, I think it's a good thing. Uh, but we got to be we got to be staffed up to handle it. Yeah, uh, and you know I just uh, I'll say um, and Kimberly can back me up on this, having been in the Judiciary Committee as well. That um, you know, as the Policy Committee, um, I, I, diversion was a really um, important program, one that had great support in that committee and and still does. Um, and I guess really this is about my um, angst about you know, understanding that diversion is um, underfunded now, that the caseloads are already high, um, and if we allow um, the funding to, to be reduced, that the, the, the program won't be able to do the work that we expect it to do, and, and that we will um, almost certainly run into the problems of um, having excessively high caseload, um, you know, possibly um, burnout or the system, the, the, the programs themselves won't be able to um, keep up. And, and you know, I would just hate to see anything happen to um, reduce the effectiveness of these programs. Um, so just trying to help help us make the case for why we need to. Create. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I just add one thing, uh, Representative Conquest, you know, mentioned the judiciary work. You know, there's a real fight, as so many of you know, to really have a uniform and standard practice across the state in terms of diversion and, and different alternatives. And a lot of the good work that came out of the legislature and in particular the judiciary committees, frankly, have achieved that uniformity and the standardization. And so for the first time, you know, on many different alternatives out of the criminal justice system, we now have a uniform system in our 14 counties and our numbers are up. And you also passed a law uh, that uh, uh, created a presumption of a referral to diversion, which increases the numbers. And so all the work I think that you guys have done uh, have led to that uniformity and standardization that we've fought for for so many years, which has rightfully increased the numbers. And I think we're going to now have added and increased numbers because of the backlog, which again, we welcome. We think it's the right thing. Um, Oh, we need the infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Mary and Kimberly. Welcome back, Kimberly. Um, <clears throat> I'm not disagreeing with any of this conversation. I just wanted to note that diversion is only one element of the restorative justice system and the other portions of it and particular that are the responsibility of the um, community justice centers are also going to be deeply pressured. And what, one of our problems with having a system and a statewide system is that it is very county based and there is different advocacy for the different programs. And I find that frequently when folks talk about diversion, they are also thinking the CJCs and some of the other restorative justice programs. 
who are not being funded. Um, and I, I, we have not had a request from the Department of Corrections, which is responsible for the CJCs to increase their funding. Um, I haven't, but, but I am really concerned about, uh, about that portion of the system when the courts, it, well, technically, before the courts open up, the CJCs could be doing lots of work. Um, and I don't think we're using that well enough. Unfortunately, they don't have a good advocate who's in here saying we need some, some of this money, or some additional money too. I'm not saying that I disagree with the request for diversion. Just noting this, we're, we're trying to get a system, it, but it's got a ways to go. And CJCs need help that we need to pay attention to too. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Kimberly? Thank you. I, I would just uh, echo uh, Chip's assessment from just having spent the limited time that I did on judiciary. There's often a casting about for some sort of a systemic reform for doing business differently. And in my opinion, this offers a way of doing business different. I almost see it as a hinge between the court system and some of the other community. And it depends if we want to keep opening that door and keep stabilizing that system. And I think finally, what I would just say is that we also spend a lot of time talking about our incarceration rates, the collateral damage along the way. There are just so many implications to getting folks involved in that system. And in my view, these sorts of more proactive investments that we can do upstream have a really great payoff downstream. So thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Are there any other comments that anyone would like to make or questions? I think Diane was waving her hand. Oh, Diane, okay. I'm sorry, I was looking for a virtual. Go ahead, Diane. No, no, that's quite all right. I had it up, but you know, sometimes I, I forget to, to put it down and, and I'd already spoken once, so I, I shouldn't shouldn't monopolize the time. But the having seen that we've got the attorney general here today and, and Marcy, there was the other issue that um, that just just so you don't think we we have forgotten about your uh, seven percent vacancy rate, and that the need for your request for to get down to four percent is still on our if we if we if we only could list and we're 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 aware of that. I don't know if you had anything more you wanted to add to that, but we're still carrying that number that you need a uh, hundred and fifty eight thousand five hundred nineteen dollars in order to make that work. Is that still correct? Yes, and look, at the end of the day, the AG's office is personnel, and either we, we have people to do the work or we don't, and if we got to keep spots open, um, there's, there's a cost to that. I would just say this, um, you know, I am proud of the fact we, we created a rapid response team in terms of um, not only raising awareness and educating, but the enforcement of the governor's executive orders. Uh, during the, the pandemic, and we're still doing that. And early on, there was a lot of questions from a lot of Vermonters about what the rules were, how they could keep their businesses open. And we took hundreds of calls and lawyers in my office answered those calls, worked with Vermonters, tried to find creative ways to comply with the governor's executive order and to keep people's businesses open. And we did that. And I think we're probably the only state that, we only had to file two cases in terms of violation of the governor's executive order. And that's because we were on the ground working with Vermonters, building that voluntary compliance with the governor's executive order to keep our numbers so low. Um, but that, that's people. That is people, I think, doing what I've always viewed as the best way to enforce the law, which is working with Vermonters, educating them about what the law is and finding a workable creative solution um, and that's why we, we need to fill those spots. That's why the vacancy uh, savings at 7%, which is higher than the statewide average, um, is an issue for us. And I think we all know come the fall, you know, we're going to be dealing with, with this stuff again. And we're going to be dealing with, with building compliance with the schools, with the colleges. We're the office that does the enforcement. And it is cross-agency. And we, we need our people. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, we have two questions, uh, one from Representative Iacovoni and then Representative Cooper. Dave? Uh, I'll be brief. Yes, thank you. Uh, before I ask Willa a question, I just wanted to uh, thank the Attorney General and his staff. He triggered my memory back in the, oh, in April, we had in my area in Lamoille County, like an uprising of all these frustrated folks who wanted to go out and do yard work and such. Yeah, and um, right. they weren't allowed to, yet there were a number of folks who were out there doing that work. And uh, the Attorney General's office helped uh, facilitate and work with our chief of police to, to calm the water some, as much as they could be. I appreciate that. Uh, my, my question, uh, Willa, um, two of them, um, how would I know if a diversion program was doing a good job? What are the metrics you look at? We, we, we do follow the results-based accountability framework. And so we, we look at successful completion rate, uh, which is sort of a tricky one because what's, you, know, you want a certain percentage to complete the program successfully, but not everybody. You want a certain amount of rigor. So um, that's one we look at. We look at um, restitution, um, whether restitution that's part of agreements are paid. <clears throat> um, and then we, excuse me, right now, or the last few years, we've started to do um, satisfaction surveys of participants, as well as of victims of cases referred to diversion. Um, and so those data are newer. Um, and we're also rolling the satisfaction of participants survey out to TAMRAC participants or people who have um, substance abuse or, or mental health treatment needs. Um, so those are our metrics that we use. We do um, also a peer review process where every three years, there's a team that visits programs and meets with staff as well as um, volunteers and trustees. Um, most, but not all of the organizations are nonprofits with, with um, boards of trustees and have a more, um, I mean, there's a paperwork review process in there, but there's also more of a qualitative um, discussion about you know, how do you, how are you using restorative justice in your organization? What's the success that you want to highlight in the past years? What are you, what are you struggling with? Um, and then the programs work up a plan. Um, and then I think the final thing I would note is each year um, agencies submit a quality improvement plan on any top, any area of their work that they wish to. And they, um, set out what we call our SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, um, saying, uh, so I know, for example, this year, two agencies are, are really focused on how to engage participants when you haven't met them in with them in person because of the challenges they're seeing. So um, mm -hmm. that's another way that, um, as a funder, we ask people to look at the quality and work on the quality of their work. And just a quick thought, thank you. Um, do you. Do you work with the adults in the household as well as the uh, younger folks? Yes, yeah, so within court diversion, there's both juvenile and adult court diversion um, out of family division as well as criminal division. So. We've had people in diversion from age of 10 to in their 80s. Um, so it's really any age. With younger participants under 18, parents are part of the program. They have to you know, agree that their child participates in the program and the agreement that's developed um, while it's with the young person or the youth or the child, it, it's understood that it's part of a family. and. Um, the contract uh, is specific to that incident, but a lot um, a sort of broader work is often done with a family to help, especially in agencies mm -hmm. that, you know, like Representative Hooper mentioned that are broader um, centers that have multiple array of services. It can be um, connecting them with in-house services or other services in the community. So while they're, case managers are not social workers, um, they, maybe they're social workers um, in light or something, that sounds dismissive, I don't wanna say that, but they're doing that type of work. Um, 
Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you. I'll follow up offline with you with some thoughts. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, Mary. Thank you. TJ, you mentioned your uh, response in the early days and the continuing response. It strikes me that though, though that work is CRF eligible, did you apply for and did you receive funds that would cover that work or the cost of that work? Yeah, is that the, is that the CARES Act? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, we were reimbursed for that. And um, I'll let Marcy answer that. Um, there was some discussion as it relates to our carry forward um, as, a, as a result of that. Um, I think I have a disagreement. Um, well, I'm recalling that you had a significant, actually, I think your funds were swept rather than allowing you to carry forward. Uh, I think I'm we, remembering that uh, correctly. Maybe we carry forward 50% of what we had. Uh, Marcy, am I correct about that? Yeah. Uh, not quite. We, no. we were allowed to carry forward 150,000 and we had 285,000 reverted. And, but to your point, I, you know, that, that rapid response team was obviously directly related to COVID and it was reimbursable, um, which obviously put our carry forward number a little bit higher. Um, but it was incredibly important work um, from whether it was as uh, Representative Yacomoni discussed, uh, dealing with people doing yard work, I remember that, but also dealing with churches, uh, dealing with big uh, businesses and product coming in that you know, would have to, um, they'd, they'd lose the value of the product because nobody can unload the trucks. And we resolved a lot of these issues by, again, um, doing the work, having lawyers on the job 24-7, uh, working with commerce to who would interpret it. And we'd have to go back and forth with them every day about what a rule meant. And then talking to Vermonters um, about what they could and couldn't do and trying to find those workable solutions so we could comply with the governor's order, but understand that the economy had to keep humming uh, as best it could uh, under, under these really unique circumstances. And that's, that's people in these jobs. And we're going to need them come the fall again, I believe. Are there any other uh, questions either uh, about the, the uh, position, uh, changing the position savings rate from 7% to 4%, which would uh, come at, um, we would need to find uh, 158 plus um, thousand in ongoing money. And I, I, think, I, I think we can really appreciate the need, TJ. I hope you can appreciate the tight position we are in right now, because it's nothing we can use one-time money for um, and I mean, we're just balancing an incredibly tight budget and using a lot of one time uh, to bridge into 2022 uh, when we hope revenues, uh, you know, the economy really rebounds. And um, so we have a challenge. I mean, we all have a challenge, but uh, the budget is particularly uh, challenging and, and, and not putting undue pressure on 22 is we're, we're really paying attention to that. I, I understand and, and respect uh, the position and certainly don't envy um, the position. I, I, I would be remiss if I did not say this though. I, I am proud of the fact that we were not one of the states where we ended up in court fighting over the legality of the governor's executive order. And I credit my team, and frankly, the governor's office, the folks at Commerce for working in, in a collaborative way to make these rules that were difficult to understand, um, understandable to Vermonters who were trying to do the best they could. Um, and, you know, I, for another time, I, I, I would, I, I, and I thank Representative Hooper for bringing it up. I understand the carry forward issue. I, I th that money shouldn't be held against us because it was reimbursable is what I would say. And um, I understand the difficulty of the position you're in, uh, Representative Toll, and I certainly respect your position and, and grateful for uh, the work you guys are doing. So thank you. And I, I will take the soapbox away from me now. <laughs> okay. I, I think that that wraps it up. I don't see any other questions and we know the two pressures. So the two pressures within the AG budget is, the AG's budget is the position 
uh, the vacancy uh, percentage, and then the um, $160,000 shortfall due to the fees. I do have to ask this question though, are the fees um, at the right amount or have the fees been looked at to be increased or should they be decreased and we look for another funding source? And I want like a one minute um, comment on that. Um, I don't know when the last time the fees have been looked at for the diversion program. Um, the fees in the statute, it's um, the cap is set at $300. Um, that has been in, in statute for many years um, before 2006 when I, when I assumed this position. Um, we've had a standard fee reduction schedule in place for three or four years, um, at which point some agencies increased their base fee and others decreased. Um, some have argued we should have a lower fee. Um, and I think there's, there's wisdom to that point. I think it's really hard to run a program on fees when the majority of the people who are you're serving are low income, which increasingly with the DLS program, that's the case. Um, and frankly, even many people who go through the criminal justice system in general. So- um, A bigger structural issue. Yes to be addressed, not just a, a one-time fix or, or filling the, the gap, but uh, of how the, how the whole program is even funded. Correct, yes. Okay, um, thank you both for coming in. Marcy, thank you for coming in. Uh, it's always good to see all of you. And um, Chip, you know, we'll be working with Chip and with Diane with these budgets and um, we need to get to closure by the end of next week. So we're going to be working quickly, but thoughtfully. Thank you. And thank you uh, for your, your guys' service. And thanks for doing all these hearings by Zoom. I know it's hard. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you, guys. I really, really admire, admire what you're doing. It's hard. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for your work as well. OK. OK. Uh, so we will uh, go off live. Thank you.